invite our media panel up and I'll do some brief introductions because once again you you do have the, the full bios. Um, I'll start with Ginger who's making her, her way up. Um, for those of you who were here last evening and, and really saw a very moving film, A Racing Family, uh, you've had the introduction to Ginger. For those of you who were not here, Ginger is a documentary filmmaker and um, did a, a movie, she lived in Argentina for a while, did a movie called The Racing Dad, which is fantastic and is archived. You can play it on the website for her current venture, The Racing Family. And we have two other media experts here um, as well. And again, I'll get them going because we're starting a little bit uh, late. So Sue Keenan will be our moderator for this panel, and uh, William McGee, they both have extensive media experience. We know that outright, outreach is important, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sue. Hello, my name is Sue Keenan. I work for our financial news channel, which you may think is an odd fit, but we're actually one of the few media outlets that cover divorce because when billionaires like Jeff Bezos get divorced or billionaire hedge fund managers get divorced, it is major news for investors because they're going to have a very bad year. Aside from that, this panel almost should be called, why is the biggest public health crisis affecting 22 million people and the most severe form of child abuse that's out there so unknown? And that's a question that we're going to address. It's also a question I asked Amy Baker, who's had a very good year. She's twice been on National Network News, NBC, and then CBS this year. So I said, what, what do you think it takes to get on the major news? I'm not talking about the blogs or legal uh, forums, but just major network news, local news. What do you think it takes? And in inimitable Amy Baker form, hold no punches, she said, someone has to die. And uh, that, unfortunately, is a reality in local news. There is a saying, if it bleeds, it leads. Death is very compelling. Uh, celebrity is also very compelling. And that is the nature of news. Sometimes we go for what's easy and what is before us. As you may know, family courts are a black box. The media is not allowed to cover it. A lot of the uh, documentation is sealed. Uh, minors cannot really be covered or interviewed by most legitimate networks. And so uh, when Halle Berry badmouths her baby daddy, as Amy Baker said, she was invited on a national network show, Joy Behar's talk show, when um, there was a murder in Rochester, a very tragic situation where a teenage daughter was psychologically abused to assist in the murder of her mother, Amy Baker was on national news. The good news is she had the opportunity to explain what psychological manipulation is. And what we have in the panelists here is important uh, stories that were put out against really considerable odds. You're going to hear about Bill McGee's rejections. You're going to hear how Ginger Gentile self-financed a very impressive film. And it really takes going against the odds to get the story out. So we're going to start with Ginger, and she's going to tell you a little bit about the film, but more importantly, how whatever track you're on, clinical, the parent track, the legal track, how you get these stories covered. Well, thank you so much for, for being here today. I'm just going to put my timer on. I have, what, 20 minutes? Yeah. OK, great. I always want to make sure I don't take up too much time. So how many um, so how many of you here raise your hand if you're a parent? Wow. How many of you are parents who are having trouble seeing your child? Let me rephrase that. How many of you are lawyers? And how many of you are mental health workers? 
some sort. Okay, great. How many of you have tried to get your story into the media? How many of you have tried to get this issue into the media in some way? A lot. How many of you have had success? Oh, good. Great. So we should all be sharing stories about the success that you all have had. I came to this issue, or in a way this issue found me, when I was living in Argentina. I'd been there for six years, and I went on a date with a man. And the first thing he says is, I'm very stressed out. It's been six years since I've seen my daughter, and I've just got out of jail. And he told me his story, which I won't get into now, but I'm sure you can all imagine what that story was. And I fell in love with a man who was willing to do anything to defend his daughter. And I came from a family of lawyers, even though I was a filmmaker at the time. I, I made, I think, the right choice to get out of the legal profession and get into something fun and glamorous. And I said, well, you know what? I'll go down to the courthouse. And I'm sure we'll get this all worked out. I'm sure your lawyer is doing a very bad job. We'll figure this out together. I'm sure in a week or two, you'll see your daughter. And then I saw all the court papers where he was ordered to see his daughter. And the daughter was never brought to him. And the request for joint custody went down to visitation to desperate pleas of please let me see my daughter for my birthday or her birthday. And then I began to meet other people who he was meeting in the courthouse, fathers who couldn't see their children. And I began to realize there was a big problem that nobody was talking about. And everyone was too ashamed to talk about because everyone blamed themselves. And in Argentina, even the professionals didn't want to talk about this issue. They were too ashamed to be associated with it. So as a documentary filmmaker, and at that point I had already made one documentary film, and with my now partner, we were running a production company, we decided to make a film. And we knew it would be very hard to get people to talk on camera, so we just said we were making a film about divorce and gender. You can think about what gender, you can think about what our angle was. And my accent and my bad Spanish helped me because people will reveal anything if they think they're talking to somebody stupid. So the first film I made, which the working title was called Equality with a question mark, which is a horrible title, became Erasing Dad. And I got professionals on camera to admit, because they thought they were doing the right thing, the good thing, about how they would work with the child to convince them that their father was bad, delay the court cases, how they knew time was on their side, and how, in their words, the worst place for a child was their own home because of the presence of a father, and fathers are just rapists in potential, waiting for that moment to rape their own children. And when the film came out, and if you watch Our Racing Dad, which you can on my website, erasingfamily.org, for free, You'll see that we didn't put any voiceover. We didn't explain that what they were saying was bad or wrong. We just let the words hang there. And the public was outraged that these people who were considered the leading experts in Argentina were saying such horrible things and assuming that they were the heroes of the story. And they were so upset they got the film censored. It was the first film censored in 20 years in Argentina. We went all the way to the Supreme Court. I think we were sued about 17 times all by the professionals in the film who were upset that they didn't look good in the film. They weren't upset that we misused their words. They were upset that they weren't being hailed as heroes. But I also knew that in Argentina, it's much worse than the United States and Europe in the sense that you cannot use the word parental alienation. Use the word parental alienation as a psychologist, you will lose your license. So we decided in the film to not mention the word once. And when people would say, you're making a film about parental alienation in the post-debates, and I had to go on talk shows and debate in, in my poor Spanish, um, they would say, well, you made a film about parental alienation. And I would say, no, I didn't. I made a film about family bond obstruction. Family bond obstruction is when a, a parent, a court, an institution, a teacher, another family member can be anybody obstructs a bond between a loving parent and a child, and this causes lasting harm. 
So let's talk about that. But I want to, oh, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Deprive the people of oxygen when they don't have good arguments. You don't have to debate on their terms. And I think this is a mistake that a lot of us make, is we go right for how can we challenge the arguments against what we're saying. And we don't realize that the vast majority of the public out there has no frame of reference on this debate. They don't even know it's in a debate. They don't even know it's a problem. I'll get in a little later how actually everybody knows about this problem. And we're in, a, we're in a very interesting point in history about changing how we talk about this. But before that, you do not have to talk about the other side's arguments. Don't bring it up. Because we are too used to arguing in court or presenting academic papers. And this, I think, is if you get one thing out of this panel, it's that talking to the media and talking to the public at large is incredibly different than going to court and publishing an academic paper. The public, the media, does not want evidence. They want an easily understandable, emotional, digestible story that they can understand in 25 words or less. How many of you can tell your story in 25 words or less? Two people raised their hands and are kind of like this, three. That's all the time people have. We live in a, in a society where we are inundated with news and social media all the time. Don't think you're special because you're not. Everybody is equally special and important in their own eyes. So you have to craft the most compelling narrative that you can in the shortest period of time that they're going to give you which often is 25 words to 30 words. Again, and we have to put on a very different hat. This is very different than an academic paper. This is very different than proving something in court. And it's a completely different way of looking at things. So do not say that this is how you should conduct a court case, or this is how you should write an academic paper, or talk to other professionals. The New York Times is written on an eighth grade reading level. And most newspapers are written on a second or third grade reading level. So when you try your talks and your speeches out and your messaging, try them out with people who don't have the best education level in the world. They need to be able to understand it. When I was in Argentina, every film I made, I showed to my house cleaner who didn't graduate high school. And if she didn't understand it, the film wasn't done. And she went to all of my premieres, and she's in all of the credits. But we all can find someone like that. Someone at the bus stop, someone who's serving us coffee. And if they don't understand our message, we need to work to change it and to modify it. We need to test everything that we say. And if it's not working, we can change it because we have data. But to do this, we have to be emotionally unattached to our messaging, which is why often the best messengers are not the people who are the most emotionally affected. And I always tell people, if you want to tell your story in public, make sure that you are ready to do so. And not everybody is, and not everybody is a great spokesperson. Some people have stories that are just too complicated. Some people have stories that are too extreme. And some people just aren't good on camera. They get flustered. They look around that, you know, they can't speak into the microphone. They go on for too long. And they might have great stories and be great people, but we need to select our spokespeople very carefully. And if we are working as an organization or as a group, we have to see who works the best and promote them as spokespeople and pull back from the people who are. So when I did the, my new film, A Racing Family, to get to the three main families that you see on the screen, I talked to probably about 100. And I actually filmed about 10. And so there are seven who you don't see in the movie at all. And they all are great families with great stories. Some are even, you know, I would say more compelling. But they just didn't have that hook, that look on camera that gets you emotionally involved. And it's a tough call, but that's what we have to do when we're deciding to tell a story. 
So again, practice your stories. See what works, and if it doesn't work, change it. So before I made a racing family, so I came back, so a little to back up a little bit. I was in Argentina for 13 years. I came back to the US in 2015. And I decided to make a follow-up film. And all I knew is that I wanted to make it international. And I wanted to include moms in the, in, in the movie. That's all I knew. And I knew nobody in the United States. So my first step was just to call people who I was meeting on Facebook groups and talk to them for an hour or two about what was going on. And what I was finding is that as the story took shape, I began to talk to other people who had no experience with this to get funding and support to pitch my project, as we say in Hollywood. And that is a great experience because you can see very quickly what works and what doesn't. So my first pitch is I would talk about how the family courts weren't working, there's a failure to see this problem, there's all these people who are affected, but nobody really knows what to do, or if they know what to do, they can't and where the funding is going, and people just looked at me like I was talking about this crazy conspiracy theory, and they didn't believe me. And then I just, I, I figured out what pitch worked, and this is when I realized everybody knows about this problem. I would say to people, imagine that you're a kid. First step, very important, most people had very, have very unhappy childhoods. So as soon as you say, imagine you're a kid, you're making them emotionally vulnerable, no matter what happened to them. Because if nothing else, you remember being small, you remember being frightened. Imagine you're a kid and you're told that your mom and your dad is bad or doesn't love you or abandon you. Most people right there say, oh my God, that's horrible. Some might even begin to well up because it happened to them. And then I say, imagine that one day you're over the age of 18, maybe you're 25, and you realize that that wasn't true, that that parent did everything in their power to fight to be with you went to court, spent all their money, and they couldn't see you, and they wanted to see you. Everybody at that point is crying. And then everyone says, oh, that happened to me. That happened to my boyfriend. That happened to my cousin. That happened to my aunt. That happened to my uncle. Oh, or someone, I met a woman who was 63 and said, oh my God, that happened to me my whole life. I never realized that I, this is my story. Because you're not asking them to know a term, you're asking them to identify in a very quick and emotional way with something. And then once you get them hooked in, then you can say, what if I told you that you, your boyfriend, your cousin, your aunt, isn't an outlier? That we know that this ha is happening to at least 22 million families in the United States. And they go, what? Yes, 22 million. But what's being done about this? Well, and then you get into the speech that you all know. But now you have a hook, as opposed to saying, Do you know, have you ever heard of the term parental alienation? Yes, no, what does it mean? You're in a definition. You're defining, defining, defining. That's not how you tell a story to the media. It's not how you tell a story when you're talking to people. Because the first rule is the hook. Then if they're hooked, you can talk to them for hours. But if you don't have them hooked, you'll be lucky to get them for 30 seconds. The other rule when talking with the media or talking to people in general is to always bring it back to a general problem. To talk about numbers and systematic failure. So a lot of parents come to me, probably on Facebook I would say once every two days, with this phrase, my story is the worst you've ever heard. It could be a movie. Has anyone here ever used that phrase when describing their story? You can see some nods. So two things happen when you use that phrase. One, you take away that this is a public health issue and affecting a lot of people. That you have something special and weird about your case. The other thing that happens though is that people don't want to get involved with something messy. They don't want to get involved with, with a conflict between a husband and wife, 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 husband, husband. Because a lot of us remember what it was like to watch our parents fight. And we wanted to stop, we wanted to go away. 
Or maybe more recently, you've been at a dinner party and a couple starts fighting. That's the easiest way to kill a dinner party, right? Everyone just goes. And that's what the media does because they don't really know who's telling the truth because you're asking for them to pick sides and to blame. And we don't want to do that. We're scared of doing that. So by talking about the systemic failure of the family courts, of, the psycho of, the, of psychology, of mental health workers to understand this problem, you're not asking for people to pick a side. You're talking about what, in general, society is getting wrong. And that means if something that society is getting wrong in general, that means that we can also fix it as a society. And there's something that we can do without intervening in your specific case or one specific case. Because also, as we all know, and as um, Sue said, these stories do make the news. But they're often presented in very yellow journalistic terms about very wealthy people. These cases are seen as extreme outliers. So just by making the news, we're not necessarily creating a path forward for change because as long as the cases are the worst ever, a crazy story could be a movie, well, then people say, well, you got very unlucky. It's like telling a story about, you know, someone who died because a piano fell on their head. People might be sympathetic, but it's not going to make them run out and say we should pass laws about securing pianos as they're raised up to the roof, right? They just say, wow, that was really unlucky. I hope I never get hit by a piano, or I'm going to look up when I walk around so the piano doesn't hit me. And this is very different from saying 10,000 people, I'm making this up, this isn't true, 10,000 people die in New York City each year from pianos falling. We need to do something about piano movement. So if we talk about the general problem, we talk about 22 million, and this is a public health crisis, all of a sudden people will start to listen. And then your story or other stories become one example of millions. Especially then you have the added hook that the solutions, often with prevention, are very cost effective. And that the prevention is, is less expensive than the cure. And always focusing on prevention. And what we can do in general to make divorce and separation and children of never married parents have a healthier childhood. Because by including this in a bigger picture of how to make separation healthier, first of all, we don't have to prove what is parental alienation to the media, which might not have the time for that, but everybody gets on board with making divorce healthier. And if someone isn't, you don't even have to argue with them because they are the outlier now. So you switch the terms of the debate. The other thing is, you know, in a, in a court case, saying that this is a form of child abuse can be very effective. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know exactly. I'm not giving legal advice here. But the words child abuse make people very squeamish. It makes them think of child sex abuse, and you, your mind goes into this kind of dark spiral. So instead, childhood trauma prevention. Talk about the ACES test, the, the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, and how we know that by preventing trauma in children, we, they will have healthier, out, healthier outcomes as adults. Who is against preventing trauma in children? Nobody. What is the current system of family court doing? Traumatizing children and parents on a massive scale. What are some of the worst effects? One of them is parental alienation. But even if it doesn't get that bad, it's still bad, right? And isn't it crazy that we're spending all this money as a society to fuel family courts, and then we're asking family to spend, families to spend all this time and money to bankrupt themselves to see their children? That's a question I always ask people. How much money should you have to spend to see your children? Flip it. And they would say, probably nothing. Oh, but a lot of people are spending tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars trying to see their children, spending their children's inheritance. So this is a, a clear way that just by changing the way we frame things, we're talking about the same way, but in a way that's very digestible to the media. So in conclusion, try out your story before you tell it. If you want to go to the public, go to the media, ask yourself if you're ready. Are you able to handle a tough question? What if there's a journalist that asks something very disgraceful? You can't be in that position that you want to punch them, right? 
Some people aren't there yet, and that's okay. We all don't have to get there. We just need a few good spokespeople. Keep it simple. I, I get parent, parents and I throw at me terms that I don't know, and I've been making films about this for eight years. Always pull it back to the numbers. You are one of millions, and this is a public health crisis. And I always ask, are we interested in preventing childhood trauma? And if the answer is yes, then you can get into all of the good information you have about how to do that. But no one will listen without an emotional hook, and no one will listen if your story isn't clear, concise, and quick. So thank you so much for your time. If you're interested in learning more about what I do or the film Erasing Family, you can visit erasingfamily.org. And we're inviting people to set up community screenings. If you want to see the film, you have to set up a community screening. And the reason why we're doing that is that this is a tool to go to the community and start talking about this problem because it's just a movie. You're just asking people to watch a movie, not to sign a petition, not to sign a position statement. So this is a great way to get a support group out into the community to talk to politicians. And it's one of many tools, but it's an easy one. Make it easier on yourself. Tell people to get some popcorn, watch a film, or some of the other great films out there. And just get people talking about it. Don't feel like you have to convince everybody the first time. Thank you. Thank you, Ginger. I think one of the key takeaways Ginger told us is that you need to make it relatable Everyone can relate to family. Our next speaker is Bill McGee. His story, Half the Child, won all kinds of awards for the first novel. It is an amazing account of what it's like to have your child abducted. This is relatable in that if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. His story also is an extraordinary account of parental devotion, something everyone here can relate to. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Ginger. Before I read from the book, before I discuss the book, before we discuss parental alienation, before we discuss custody, abduction, any of it, I want to start with a confession. And that is that I worked on this novel, Half the Child, for over 20 years. Not 20 years consecutively. Put it aside at many times. It took many different forms. It took a very long time for me to process it emotionally other books I've written in less than a year. But during that entire time, I have no problem saying to a room full of experts in the field that up until about two years ago, I had never heard the two words, parental alienation, put together, ever. If I did, it went right over my head. And I was someone who lived with it for more than 20 years. And I was someone that was writing about it for more than 20 years. And I think that's at the heart of this experience for hundreds of thousands of children and parents in this country alone. Uh, 75 years ago, in 1944, my father stormed ashore on the first wave in Anzio. It was his fourth invasion of World War II. He came home. He lived another 60 years until 2004. And for about 50 of those years, he was angry, he was violent, he was depressed and he was a textbook case of parent, uh, PTSD. I know that he went to his grave at the age of 85, never having heard that term. He lived it every day for 60 years, and I know that he had never heard post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think that's a big part of what we're doing. When we talk about the media, when we talk about awareness, it's not just a matter of alerting journalists, alerting regulators, legislators. Sometimes it's a matter of alerting the very people who live with it. And I know, and that's why, again, I wanted to start with that confession. I, uh, I, had, I didn't know there was a name for it. I mean, many conditions like that. There have been alcoholics around for millennia, but, you know, alcoholic became a term, you know, about 100 years ago. So, I'd like to um, just speak a little bit before I, I read a short excerpt about the concept of fiction versus nonfiction, uh, because I do both. I write fiction, I write nonfiction. I'm a novelist, I'm a journalist, I'm an investigative journalist. I, um, 
I'm also a teacher. I've been writing fiction and nonfiction most of my adult life, both. And I've taught both fiction and nonfiction for more than 10 years. And in every class I've ever taught, every creative writing class, whether it was fiction or nonfiction or both, I always started with my favorite writing quotes. And in the first class of every semester, I always quoted Mark Twain. It's like most Mark Twain quotes, it's been mangled and you know, reported incorrectly. But the basis is, truth is stranger than fiction, but it is because fiction is obliged to stick to possibilities. Truth isn't. Okay, and that always gets you know a few smirks, and it always gets a few people saying, "Oh, okay, that's cute." Um, but he's right. Okay, I can guarantee you. And anyone who has spent as much time as I have in writing workshops, in fiction writing workshops, as either a student or as an instructor, can tell you that that's where the strongest arguments come, where it's like, I don't buy that. That couldn't happen. No way. It doesn't happen in journalism classes. It happens in fiction classes. And so for me, it was a personal struggle for a long time. I wanted to write about parental love. And the question for me, which it obviously took me a very long time to work out, is what form would that take? And then once I knew in my heart that fiction was the way to tell that story, then it came very easily after that. And so I just want to give you a little flavor of uh, Half the Child. And um, it's a, this is the, uh, this is the cover of the book. It's a uh, shameless promotion. It's for sale right outside. Cash or credit card. Amazon, print, Kindle, barnesandnoble.com, soon to be audio book. But um, I did have a working title for a while, Underneath Half the Child. I had Half the Child, colon, a love story. Because to me, that's fundamentally what it is. It's a different type of love story. It's a love story between a parent and a child. In this case, a father and a son. It could very well be a mother and a daughter. And it chronicles four consecutive summers. It's told in first person, and it's told in present tense by a young man named Michael Mullen, who's in his early 30s. And it chronicles the love story between Michael and his young son, Ben, in four consecutive summers. The book is more or less divided into four equal sections. Book one is the summer when Ben is two and a half. Book two, he's three and a half, then four and a half, then five and a half. And their lives start spiraling way out of control as far as Michael is concerned. On page one, he doesn't see any of the events that are about to undertake him. And by the last few pages, the same thing is happening. He's falling and spiraling downward throughout this novel. He never, that's the reason that I told it in first person. That's the reason I told it in present tense. He has no perspective. Past tense inherently gives you perspective. You're looking back at an event, whether it's a month or whether it's 50 years. He's writing present tense because he's like in the middle of a car accident. I look at this as a 361 page car accident. It's like billiard balls. His life and Ben's life, they're in constant flux throughout this entire book. And each of the four sections chronicles a stage in Ben's development. Anyone that spends time as a caregiver or a parent around young children, first of all, if you're receptive to it, you know that you learn as much as you teach them. But you also know they become very obsessive with stages. And so in book one, the stage is colors. I'll read you the opening paragraph. It's a summer of colors, especially primary colors. The life of a two and a half year old is packaged with red or reds, blue or blues, yellow or yellows. No mauves or fuchsias or taupes. Toddlerhood is the first critical lock in the canal of capitalism when lifelong brand loyalties are forged. So the designers, packagers, architects, and marketers all possess the same palette. On Thomas and Friends DVDs, Thomas the Tank Engine is blue, James is red, and Molly is yellow. Shading will come later. That's the opening of book one, the, the, the summer of colors. Book two is the summer of numbers, when Ben becomes obsessed with counting and addition and numbers and adding things up. Book three is words and language, when he starts playing with words and, and putting concepts into words and language. And then book four is a little more esoteric. It's, it's, it's summer of concepts and ideas. And so throughout these four summers, the situation keeps devolving. The mother, who is central, to this drama, obviously, is very rarely seen on page, and she's not even named. I didn't want to write a divorce story. I'm not saying that 
someone couldn't write a very interesting divorce story, but for me personally, I would have found it boring. It would have been too much of a he said, she said. I wanted to write a story, a love story, between a parent and a child under the most stressful conditions imaginable, forces outside of them to try and deprive them apart. And the stakes couldn't be higher, as far as I'm concerned. And so um, I had to make a decision on where to set it. It's set in Queens, New York, where I grew up. And um, I also had to make a decision on what Michael's life was like. I thought I would give him a, a, a job that was um, uh, very low on, on stress and very low stakes. So I made him an air traffic controller at LaGuardia Airport. And um, throughout the course of these four summers, Michael's life is impacted negatively in every possible way. His physical health, his emotional and mental health, his finances, his career. Um, eventually, I won't give too much away, but eventually, in a very, very critical scene, Michael is sort of an air traffic controller's air traffic controller. He's a professional. He has the ability to lock everything out when he's up in the tower. And for the first time ever, because of Ben and because of the events that are unfolding, um, he doesn't. And something quite dramatic happens. Um, he also winds up, I'm not giving too much away, these aren't spoilers, he winds up filing for personal bankruptcy, he winds up in a suicidal depression, he winds up uh, virtually homeless, sleeping on his brother's sofa. All of this because throughout these consecutive summers, in the opening, um, his wife, soon to be ex-wife, announces that she's leaving and she's taking Ben with him. And like most reasonable adults, once he gets over the shock and the pain and the, and the sorrow and the anger, he says, well, it's one thing for you to leave, but you're not taking Ben. And so um, that affects all aspects of his life and Ben's life. And this is a book that chronicles a lot of comings and goings. There are a lot of departures. And anyone that has been in a custodial situation knows about that. They constantly, little children are constantly saying goodbye and hello and hello and goodbye to the people they love the most very often. And so, um, as I say, the stakes keep increasing. It goes from a separation to a divorce to a custody battle, ultimately to an abduction, an international abduction where Michael has no idea what country his son is in. And um, so I'm going to read you a section that um, takes place uh, about, a, about a third of the way into the book. And it, it, I think it speaks to this issue of comings and goings. This is by no way, by no means, the, the most dramatic section of the book. But the judge, in this case, keeps allowing, since Ben is so, you know, so young, keeps allowing uh, Ben's mother to take him further and further away. So he has spent a year against Michael's strong objections in uh, Indiana while she is teaching there. And he finally gets home, and Michael thinks this is, this is it. You know, the bad times are over. Now we'll all be nearby, and we're going to work this out, and we'll come up with some sort of arrangement. He has no idea that things are just going to get worse and worse and worse. So in this section, it's a summer of departures and arrivals. Ben returns to LaGuardia on a hot Friday in May. Within minutes after the 737 taxis to a halt, I'm waiting at the happy end of the jet bridge. My FAA identification strung around my neck like a PASG for him. She and Ben are among the last to exit, and when he sees me squatting near the ticket counter, his face quickly lights up. But then just as quickly, he looks down and clings to her forearm. He's never reacted to me like this before in his life. In fact, I have to gently pry him from her to finally get a hug. I smile at him, believing Ben's back home for good. Then there are a few other sections. This book is not divided into numerical chapters. It's divided into just sections that the shortest one is one sentence, the longest one is 10 pages. And then a few sections later, there's a follow-up from a few days later. It's my first, and by the way, a trigger warning, there could be a very foul word of 10 letters. Not 12 letters, but 10 letters. It's my first full day alone with Ben since he returned from Evansville. We're on the widest park of the Grand Central Parkway. Heading east with the fairgrounds on our left as we cruise toward the Van Wick and a trip to the Coney Island Aquarium. Ben's in his perch, strapped into the car seat in the center of the wagon, riding high where I can see his face drooping onto his left shoulder. He's out for a nap, the dog in his lap. I'm not sure how to interpret why Ben's been acting so strange the last few days. The hesitance at the end of the jet bridge last week ling lingered, albeit sporadically. He has never shied away from hugging me, kissing me, holding my hand. But ever since she walked him off that plane, it's as if Ben knows something about me that I don't. He'll forget it for hours at a stretch, and then revert 
as if recalling absent instructions. I pop in one of my favorites, Warren Zevon, and sing along, ignoring the bright orange check engine light on the dashboard. Lovey needs new tires, a new battery, new suspension. But the money I don't have to spend on those things has already been promised elsewhere. Send lawyers, guns, and money. We're in the left lane and inching up towards 70 miles per hour. Then, before any sane person can even fathom why, the silver Mini Cooper in front of me slams full on the brakes. My brain instantly calculates that this dipshit only just grasped he's four lanes away from the Harry Von Arsdale Jr. Avenue exit, and therefore the lives of multiple strangers, men, women, children, pets, dogs, should be endangered, since that's clearly a better option than doubling back on Queens Boulevard and exit later. I can see the undercarriage of that crappy little car as the brake lights tilt upward from the sudden deacceleration. My brain simultaneously, simultaneously calculates neither the laws of physics nor the God I prayed to at St. Rita's school when I still believed in his existence would be enough to prevent me from rear-ending this oh-so-selfish prick in, his 4, in my 4,300-pound station wagon. But I recall the words of Bob Hoover, the greatest pilot who ever lived, fly as far into the crash as possible. I brake and steer and brake and steer, and the wagon jerks, and then it squeals, it slides, and it shimmies, and now we're just past the Cooper's left rear quarter panel as we kick up last week's winter's rock salt and plow through the grassy median, past the prick, and fishtail back into the fast lane. All this in the time it takes to grimace. In the patch of rearview mirror above head, Ben's head, I instantly see that, miraculously, for the first time since Robert Moses built the damn parkway, no one is tailgating in the left lane. It all happens so fast I don't even get a look at the selfish one piloting the Cooper. The wagon rights itself as though it's on tracks, and we continue. But the adrenaline, as always, has burst onto the scene and now wants to stay. I feel my pulsing vessels and pound the steering wheel with the meat of my palm. Cocksucker, I hiss in fury at what a careless, faceless stranger was prepared to take. And then I hear it. Cocksucker, Ben chimes in. The rear view shows he's more than stirring. He's positively alert. I make, I make my living finding the right words to express myself on a moment's notice during flashes of terror and distress. But for once, I'm vocally challenged and I falter. The lecture about saying bad things just won't program itself. Instead, I say what I truly, truly feel. I love you, buddy. For the first time since his return, his smile is genuine. I love you, Daddy. Ben is back. So I didn't know, for one thing, when I wrote those lines, I think about three years ago, that there would be a movie coming out this year uh, called Ben is Back. But those weird things happen when you write fiction. Um, so Sue mentioned uh, the struggle in trying to get this story out to the world. Um, I've been very lucky as a writer. I've had you know, success as an author, with, um, particularly with nonfiction. And um, this is my first book, which has nothing to do with parental alienation. It's called Attention All Passengers. It's about airline safety. It's a nonfiction book. Uh, it's published by HarperCollins. It was endorsed by Ralph Nader and by Captain Sully Seldenberger. And um, it was sold in about three hours. So I thought that's how it works. My agent, you know, I thought, well, it's going to be a long process trying to sell it. And he sent it out at 10 in the morning. At 1 o'clock in the afternoon, we had an offer that was a terrific offer. And so I said, OK, that's how it's going to work. And then I, I switched agents for this novel. And I, I got a young guy who was at one of the biggest agencies, ICM. And you know, you can never be cocky and think it's going to be easy. But you know, I thought, well, eventually, there's a term they use in publishing. It will find a home. I was you know, fairly confident, because my agent was confident that half the child would find a home. Um, well, I had to make that home. I had to build it myself. It's called self-publishing. Okay. This is the book. I, you know, I put together the money to hire an artist for the cover, hire editors, hire uh, publicists, do all of that. It's available, as I said. I mean, I was kidding about self-promoting, but I'm not. Um, you know, this is a book that I, I sell myself, and I've managed to get it onto Amazon, get it into Barnes and Noble. It's a very hard process. Many people in this room have been very supportive of me and have had me come speak at you know different different. Um, PSI, PAS meetings around the country. But um, I will share with you, this isn't about, you know, uh, about a writer's ego or anything like that. I will share with you that, you know, just the tone of the rejections, because I, I think it speaks to the larger issues about perceptions, parental alienation and, and, and media perceptions, and of custody, of abduction. Um, when the rejections started coming in, um, they're never fun. You never get thin, you never get skin thick enough that it doesn't hurt a little bit, but no writer that I know doesn't have rejections. I could wallpaper my den with rejections if I had a den, of course. Um, but these were a little unusual. 
one of the rejections was three pages long. And it just doesn't happen. Who writes a three-page rejection? It's usually, this isn't for me, and I wish you luck. And so I had to reach out to friends of mine who are authors. And thankfully, I have, I have many of them. And friends of mine from, from graduate school and from fellow teachers and other novelists. And I said, is this me? And to give you a sense, um, these are the types of, of, of comments. I found the protect. This is a, a novel that is about a child who has been abducted and his father who adores him, and he adores his father. They don't know. They have no contact with each other because they don't even know what continent the other is on. I found the protracted legal battle at the novel's heart to feel a little too self-righteous at times. I know that's not an entirely fair criticism, but I don't mean to minimize the pain. At the risk of sounding overly politically correct, forgive me. I just don't think the righteous anger was fully warranted. Another one said, as much as I was rooting for Michael, the narrator, in his quest for custody, I didn't quite feel the sense of stakes. What was at stake? These are actual quotes from actual editors who I won't name. Another one said, despite the em empathic chronicling of a system rigged against fatherhood, I don't see enough readers reading this. A heartfelt memoir about fatherhood feels very small. An urgent memoir about the legal obstacles facing a father in a custody battle seems very narrow. And this is my favorite. This may sound odd, but I can't get on board with this novel because William J. McGee is just too good a storyteller. He's a wonderful writer and has created a realistic, nuanced portrayal of a custody battle, and I just couldn't stand it. It's not where I want to be. It's not that I'm looking for feel-good novels, but this is too painful. Those are the things you don't want to be told as a writer, right? That it's too good. So, um, I reached out to friends who are writers, as I said. And, you know, it's always a tough thing when you're a writer. Does the book suck? Or is it me? Is it not, right? And um, enough of them said to me, something weird is happening here. It's this whole issue. It's this issue of parental alienation. It's this issue of gender, even though... I can't stress it enough. This is, there isn't a word in this book that is misogynistic. There is a very disturbed character at the heart of it. She happens to be female, could just as easily be male, as I know full well from people in my life. One of the people closest to me in my life right now is undergoing a very similar struggle that I underwent. I'm a man, she's a woman. I'm a father, she's a mother. I was a non-custodial parent. She's a custodial parent. And, yes, our, and yet our experiences are like mirror images. So for me, it's never been about gender. This book is not about gender. Michael is surrounded by women, by his mother, by his sisters, by his female friends who give him support. Um, there's a, there are a couple of fallacies in the publishing industry, in my view. And I was, I was told them by another agent who said to me, only women buy books. Only women read books. And women will not want to read a book about a loving, caring, devoted father. So if you go to Amazon and look up Half the Child, you'll see as of this morning, not that I look every day or anything, but I look this morning, there are 53 reviews. Um, here's the self-serving part. 51 of them are five star, two are four star. Um, and all 53 of the 53, all but five are written by women. So I don't know what the moral of the story is, but um, I have made a commitment, just as I made a commitment as a father, that nothing, nothing, that ever stand between my son and me. I made a commitment to this book, and that's why I'm so grateful to everybody in this room, to Dr. Burnett, to Dr. Baker, to everyone at PASG for, for allowing me to have this form, because I'm not going to stop. I'm going to I'm going to sell this book out of the back of my car. I'm going to I'm going to go to readings. You know, I, I I've been to book clubs with three people. Uh, I go to bookstores and you know don't sell a book, but I go home and I've talked to some people about it. So that's good too. And sometimes you talk to someone and they don't buy a book, but they talk to someone else. And that fallacy that I spoke about with um, you know women only buy books and everything, even if that were true, which it's not, to me women are responding so strongly because so many women have men in their lives who have been hurt by this. And of course, so many women have been hurt by it too. So, I mean, I reject the gender aspect of it. Um, I, don't, I think we want to have time for 
for Q&A, so there might be more questions. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. Showrunners here. Do we have five minutes for questions? Yeah, four or five. Do you have? The, the good news is that Bill does have some movie interest in this. Um, he does have the 51 five-star reviews. And one more point I'd like to make. Two of the biggest stories that were covered by the so-called, you know, uh, legitimate media uh, internationally were the David Goldman story, a son abducted to Brazil that became an international story where he was able to bring his son back, and the David Rookie story where there was actually a criminal sanction. Uh, those were covered, those, everyone related, and I think he's going to do fine. Uh, I should add, I have that book on my Kindle, and it would be great. Oh, Anyone thank else? You thank you. I appreciate it. Anyone else with a question? All right, if not, I'm just going to summarize to keep us on track. I think the takeaways here, uh, as Ginger pointed out, you have to keep it simple. You have to realize the media does not want a complex story. They want something that's relatable. If you can relate it to the systemic failure of a system, if you can relate it to something that if it affects your child or your family, it can affect every other child of divorce in the state, that is more likely to get attention. If you come up against obstacles, failure is not an option is a good motto to keep because these two storytellers found a way around significant obstacles. Ginger's movie will premiere in New York next week. And Bill, like I said, has some interest from a producer so stay tuned on where his story goes. One piece of advice I will offer anyone who does want to try and get their story out is to Google your story in that very short format, whether it's a therapist who acted unethically or whether it's a child who was abducted. Uh, Google it, see if anything was covered similar by a reporter in your state. Read the story they wrote on an unethical judge or an unethical therapist or uh, and then call them up and say, I like what you did with this story. I have something that may advance the topic and present it as dispassionately as you can as a story that affects every other parent in the state. Thank you. OK, I'm just going to add one thought of, of more than historical note. Um, if, if Amy's contribution is to get this in the nudes, unfortunately, we need the most tragic of all situations. So, okay, if Amy's contribution is that to get this in the nudes, we need the most tragic of all stories, I want to remind everybody of Pamela Richardson from Vancouver, Canada, who wrote the book A Kidnapped Mind. Her son ultimately committed suicide as a result of being caught in the middle of a loyalty bind. And uh, Pam was an early trailblazer in awareness because she herself um, is a media person. I don't think she's still a media person, but certainly was at the time. So it's important not to lose the history there as well. And an early example of, of a mom who was alienated um, to push back to detractors. Part of the problem is very few people are willing to write about or be interviewed about personal trauma of that level. Um, so I, I, I had a case in Oshawa, Ontario, where after winning a custody reversal in a case of false allegations of sexual abuse on behalf of a father, um, rather than go with the decision, uh, the mother killed the child and hung herself. These are the traumas um, unspeakable, um, and I can understand why there's reticence to speak of it. Um, so we have to be sensitive that, that the most compelling of situations from a media perspective are probably not going to be available to us. Um, and we 
got to make the best of the types of stories that uh, that we do have available. Um, so you see this from time to time in the news, the way we do divorce today, causing people to act in in um, the most hor horrific ways possible. Um, and, and it's systemic reform that's going to stop it. So we're going to take a 15-minute break. We're back with David Curl, and please be on time. Thanks.